Okay. All right. Well, um, happy Monday. Thanks for uh, coming to class despite the rain. Hope you had a good weekend. Um, we'll go ahead and take a look. Uh, today we'll look at uh, environments and scoping, and we'll look at a few things. Um, my notes are based very largely in part on uh, Hadley Wickham's textbook, Advanced R. All of my diagrams and illustrations were copied from his website, so um, you can do more reading on uh, all of these things uh, at, at, the, uh, at those pages there. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about binding and scoping. Um, so first of all, um, you know, all of the objects uh, created and stored in R are created in what we call our workspace. This is also known as our global environment, and this is kind of where you are doing most of your work. Um, when you execute a function, okay, a function creates a local environment, and objects created inside the function in that local environment are accessible only inside the function. And objects kind of created locally in that local environment do not appear or really interact at all with the global, uh, values in the global environment. Okay, um, If you have something inside the local environment that has the same name as something in the global environment, the objects in the local environment take precedence over objects in the global environment, right? So a global object will be masked by the, a local object that happens to have the same name, okay? So here's just a very simple line of code. We do x assignment operator c123, right? So what does this do? So we often think of this informally as creating an object x, which contains the value, a vector of values 1, 2, 3. Um, technically, what's going on here is that this assignment operator binds the name x to the vector 1, 2, 3. Okay? And what this does is it creates an object in memory with the values 1, 2, 3. Okay? And then it takes the name x and it binds it to that object in memory. So you can think of memory as kind of like a chalkboard where you can kind of like write things on the chalkboard so you can refer to that value later. Right? So basically what I'm doing here is that C123 is create is you're writing 123 in the corner of the chalkboard. Okay? And then um, and then X is now going to point to basically that corner of the chalkboard. Okay? You're gonna say X is get when you call for X, we're talking about the value in that corner. Okay. Alright. So let's look at this. Here I do x, or assigning 1, 2, 3 to x. Then I take x and I assign it to y. And then I take uh, c, 1, 2, 3, and I assign it to z. What is the difference between y and z here? Yeah. Y will change the value when you plot up x to this, or do I have So um, in Python, that would be true. In R, uh, R has a few kind of funny rules. but it is true that y and z are pointing to different objects, okay? So variables in R are references to kind of memory locations. So x and y point to the same location. So this, again, I wrote like 1, 2, 3 in, let's say, the top left corner of the chalkboard, and I have x points to that object in the top left, which has 1, 2, 3, and then y also points to that exact same object in the top left, 1, 2, 3, okay? When I do 1, 2, 3, and I do z, it's like I'm writing 1, 2, 3, in a different corner of the chalkboard, maybe the lower right, all right, one, two, three in the lower right corner. And I have Z and it points to the object in the lower right. And so all of these things have the values one, two, three, but X and Y are pointing to the same object in the top left. Z is pointing to a different object, which happens to have the same values, but in the lower right, okay? And, um, and so these are different objects in memory that happen to have the same value. So, um, and you know, R handles all of this kind of memory allocation. I don't know if you've ever coded in another language where you have to like kind of declare your variables, you have to kind of create these buckets in memory, and then when you want to get rid of them, you, you know, you clear them out and stuff. And, uh, and if you don't do that, then you know, you're, you might have like this memory leak where you have, <laughs> it keeps come adding uh, a bunch of usage of memory and, 
Here, you know, R has this thing where it just kind of clears out the memory. You get this garbage collector type of thing, okay? So it happens uh, automatically. We often don't have to think about it. But just having a, a simple idea, simple understanding of memory management can help us kind of write better code, okay? R does this thing called copy on modify, okay? So here, I write one, two, three in the top left corner of my chalkboard. Uh, put create this object in memory. X points to that object. Okay, uh, and then here I say X is Y, and then and so Y also points to that exact same object. One, two, three in the top left corner. And now I say the third value in Y, and you can do this with double or single square brackets. But I say, you know, I want to change the third value in Y, and I want to assign the value four to that. So R has this. Uh, the way R handles this is it says, oh, you want to change the third value in Y to 4, okay? Um, what it does is it creates a copy and it modifies it. So it sees this code is going to modify Y, and when it does that, it creates a copy. So in the beginning, X and Y were pointing to the same object, but as soon as you say, I want to change the third value in Y to 4, R creates a copy. So, you know, it started off with 1, 2, 3, and then it just kind of writes down one, two, three somewhere else, and then it changes that third value and it writes a four, okay? So X remains one, two, three, and Y now has one, two, four in it, okay? So um, R has, it runs this kind of copy on modify. So again, you don't, you often don't have to think about it. You go, oh, okay, well, X is one, two, three. Here I change Y, Y is now one, two, four, and, um, and that's what happens. Whereas, again, in other languages, if you did this, if you changed the third value in Y to 4, it would also affect X or something like that, okay? Um, but R, R does copy on modify. Um, so anyway, assignment is the act of binding a name to a value, okay? Scoping is kind of the reverse. So um, assignment says, all right, here's the value and here's the name for that, okay? Scoping says, okay, now that I give you a name, tell me the value associated with the name. Okay, scoping is finding the value associated with the name. So um, the scope of a variable is basically the region of code where that variable is defined. When I say, hey, I, I need a y, where can I find y, right? When, when you don't, when you ask for a name that doesn't exist in that scope, that's when R says, hey, you know, object not found. Okay, it says object x not found or whatever. That means you're, it's outside of the scope. Okay, basic scoping rules I think are pretty simple. Uh, so here what, I, I take, um, I assign one to y, then we're gonna create a function g. Inside the function g, I assign two to y, and the last line of the function g returns the value x plus y. Um, function g is defined with the argument x, so that when I call the function, um, it, it assigns basically the, that, that value to the name x. Okay, so if I call, what is the output of g of 3? What is this function going to output? What value is it going to return? Yeah, it's going to return the value of 5, right? So, because you call g of 3, x gets the value 3. So, when we're returning uh, x plus y, we take 3. We're saying, what's y? y is 2 inside the function. So it returns five. Okay, no problem there. No problem, it finds y in the current environment. Simple enough. Okay, um, sometimes you write a function and inside the function you use values, <laughs> variable names that weren't defined in the function. This is, not, um, this is not best practice. Best practice is inside your function you should only use values inside the function, um, but um, but ours is kind of like, uh, yeah, you know what? Not everyone has to follow best practices. Ours, R was designed <laughs> for the statistician in mind and not necessarily the computer or software engineer. Um, and so when, uh, when it encounters these situations, rather than throwing an error, R just says, all right, let's do our best, okay? And so here uh, we have lexical scoping. So this is the main scoping rule in R. That is, if R can't find a value inside the function body scope, it's going to search the next higher scope. 
for that um, value, all right? So the, again, this is generally considered poor technique, but, um, but R just tries its best rather than erroring out. So here we're gonna have Y is one in the global environment. F is a function, F is a function of X, and X, this function F is gonna return X plus Y. So if I X call what is F of three, X gets the value three via the arguments, and then it says X plus Y, so X has three, it's looking for Y, can't find Y here inside the function. So it's gonna say, all right, let's look in the higher scope, global environment, global environment Y has one, so it's gonna return uh, four. Okay, um, variables defined within a scope only exist in that scope and only for the duration of that scope. Um, if variables exist with the same name outside the scope, those are separate. Don't interact with the variables inside the scope. They're not overwritten. Um, a function is its own separate environment, and it really only communicates to kind of the, quote, outside world via the arguments going in and the object that it returns going out. And so if you were to run this command, rm list equals ls, remember this is the command that we use to clear out our glo uh, global environment or just clear out the environment, if we write that inside a function, which, by the way, you never want to do, um, what this would do is it would delete all of the objects that have been defined inside the function, okay? So like when you call a function and you say um, f of 3, that assigns the name uh, value 3 to the name x, but re rm list equals ls would remove that, okay? But again, only the stuff inside the function and not anything outside. The exception is the super assignment operator, this kind of double arrow thing. That's gonna search the higher scope uh, until it reaches uh, the global environment if necessary. This is considered a dangerous operator. You should not use it. I will show you examples of super assignment at the very end of today's lecture, but again, I'm gonna say don't use it, <laughs> all right? But it, is, it does exist, it does exist. Okay, so let's just try out some basic scoping rules. Okay, I got X, Y, Z, uh, all of those get the value one in the global environment. I also create a function F. Inside that function F, I assign the value two to Y, and then inside F, I create a function G. And then the very last line of the function F says we're gonna return G, okay? Um, so we, it calls G and it says return whatever G returns when we execute it. Okay, well what happens when we execute G? So well, here's our question. If I run F, what's it gonna return? So when I run F, uh, the code, that I, there's no arguments going in. The first line of code says Y gets the value two, and then uh, I create a function G, and then I return G. All right, so let's run G, okay? When I run G, I assign three to Z, and it says return X, Y, and Z. Okay, so first thing, I'm searching for X. What is the value of X that I find? Don't find X inside here. Don't find X inside the higher scope. So I find it in the global environment, it's the one. Then I say, okay, I need a value for Y. I search inside the current local scope. I don't have Y here. So I search the next higher scope, which is inside of F. Y gets the value two. Then I say, All right, I need to add Z. I search for Z and I find Z is the value three. So I'm gonna do one plus two plus three and uh, G is gonna return six. So F executes and G returns six and then so F is gonna return six. So when I run F, I get six. Okay, after I run F, what are the values X, Y, and Z in the global environment? They're all one, okay, nothing's changed. So we have F return six, X, Y, and Z are all just one, one, and one. Okay, great. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about environments. This is actually a data structure. Environments themselves are a data structure. This enables scoping. And the job of the environment is to get, basically bind names to values. And you can think of an environment as a bag of names. Each name points to an object stored somewhere in memory. So these are all kinds of objects in memory. You can think of this as like the chalkboard and then this gray box is the environment where the names are pointing to these different objects in memory. Oh, let me give you your first view quiz answer, which is the letter A, okay? A is our first view quiz answer. A as an apple. All right. So, yeah, A points to an object false. 
B points to an object with the character string A, so on and so forth. Okay. Um, as with everything in R, environments themselves are objects, and then to work with an environment, it's kind of like working with a list, but um, but there's an exception, all right? So you can use double square bracket, you can use dollar sign notation. So if you ask what is the type of E, it's an environment. What is the name, what is the value associated with the name C in the environment E? So E dollar sign C has the value 2.3. <coughs> e double square bracket D has the value 1, 2, 3. Okay. Um, environments though, again, are like bags. And in a bag, there's no ordering. So a list, you can say, hey, I want the third object in the list. Okay. But if I say, hey, reach in your backpack and give me object number four. Okay, that's like weird. Okay, because inside your backpack you don't have, you don't order these things, right? It's just it's just a bag of things. There's no ordering there, so you can't just say, "Hey, I, th this is object four. Okay, so uh, so if you ask, try to subset using um, give me position, um, that produces an error. You can list off all of the names inside um, an environment using ls. Uh, this we often use this in the global environment. We just do ls blank, okay, ls parentheses, and that lists off all of the names of objects that exist in the global environment. If you actually specify an environment object that you've created, uh, it gives you all of the names inside that environment. Okay, and you can also do ls.str, and that will give you the names and basically a little bit of more detail, the structure of each of those things. So it's going to say, hey, this is a logical vector, and this is a character vector, and things like that. Okay, so you get that. Um, unlike lists, uh, the single square bracket doesn't work for environments. And then setting an object to null doesn't remove the object. Okay, so here if I do e dollar sign d is null and I ask for that, that thing still exists. Whereas if you wanted to actually remove something, you have to use the rm function. Okay, rm is going to remove a name from the environment. Okay. Every environment has a parent environment, which is another environment, okay? Um, in these diagrams, these gray boxes, I guess on the projection they look like white boxes, but on my screen they're gray, <laughs> okay? Um, these gray boxes have these blue circles. This represents the parent environment, okay? So this environment has the names A, B, C in it. Its parent is this environment, which has the names D and E, and this box is in parent environment is the empty environment, okay? So the parent is used for lexical scoping. If R can't find a name in the current environment, it looks at the parent environment. And it keeps climbing up the kind of the ancestry of parents until it reaches the very top level environment, which is going to be the env empty environment. That's the only environment that doesn't have a parent, the empty environment. Whereas, um, you know, basically all the other environments have a parent. Um, and R only searches up, okay? So, I, you know, you could have um, multiple environments with the same kind of parent environment, like, right, there could be an environment with, quote, children environments, but R is never going to go down and search down, like, the child paths. It always only searches up. Um, there are, I guess, some special environments that we want to kind of bring attention to. So you have global environment, you can refer to that. That's kind of our workspace. Uh, this is the environment that you normally work in. And the parent of the global environment is the last package that you attached with library, okay? Which is a little bit strange, I'll explain. Um, you have the base environment. This is the environment of the base package and its parent is the empty environment. So the base environment contains like functions like C that we use to create vectors and or um, you know really kind of basic level functions like create a list that's going to be in the base environment um, like find I think the mean is a base environment thing okay um, uh, the empty environment is the ultimate ancestor of all environments it's the only environment without a parent so the base environments parent is the empty environment okay and then environment that's just the current environment um, when you call search okay this lists all the parents of the global environment this is called the search path because when R when you ask R for a function when you say like hey 
calculate the standard deviation of a vector, right? You never created a function called SD, but R knows to R knows that you want the standard deviation. How does it do that? Well, it looks for SD currently in the global environment, right? So you could, you could create a function called SD in the global environment. Not a good idea, but you could, and um, that could happen, right? Like if you, as you're doing your homework, if you create a function called C, <laughs> okay, that's gonna break a bunch of stuff because like you won't be able to create vectors anymore because you're, you're gonna, you know, R is gonna try to use that to create vectors or anytime you use C. So, um, but it starts in the global environment and it looks for something and it says, okay, well, I didn't find it. And then it goes up the search path. Um, because this, uh, these slides were created using, uh, I knit using uh, an R markdown document. It searches the package knitter, package stats. Stats contains functions related to statistics like standard deviation, like uh, LM that we use to create linear models. That's inside package stats, stuff like that. Um, you've got package graphics, which is used to create our plots, GR devices, utils, data sets, methods, auto loads, package base, and again, bases contains your basic functions and stuff like that, okay? So this is kind of our search path. Here's the global environment, and these are all of the different packages that we've loaded. At the top, we have the base environment, and then the base environment's parent is the empty environment, okay? <coughs> and then so when you call library, and you say, hey, load in a new package, like library ggplot, ggplot2 or something, okay? That's gonna put in a new package into the search path. And so now, you know, before you say, hey, I wanna ggplot something, and ggplot is not a function that exists in the search path, so you get an error that says, you know, fun thing not found, okay? But now, now that you've loaded ggplot2 as a, one of the packages, you can say, hey, I want to use ggplot, and it says, ah, I found this thing, and it can do it, okay? So, so the parent of the global environment changes. Um, these, uh, most of the environments that, uh, that we work with are created as a consequence of using functions, and um, there's actually four types of environments associated with a function. You have the enclosing environment, the binding environment, the execution environment, and the calling environment. The enclosing environment is the environment where the function is created. Every function has one and only one enclosing environment. There are three other types of environments, and there could be zero, one, or actually many, multiple environments associated uh, with each of those functions, right? So a binding environment is a function, a binding a function to a name creates the binding environment. So where the kind of that um, that name exists is the uh, binding environment. When you call a function, okay, that creates a temporary execution environment that stores uh, valuables uh, as they're created uh, during execution. Um, and then every execution environment is associated with a calling environment, and that tells you the environment from which it was called, okay? Uh, when a function is created, it gains a reference to the environment where it was made. This is the enclosing environment. This is what we use for lexical scoping. When you give a function a name, okay, the environment where that name exists is the binding environment, okay? In most of your day-to-day -day scenarios, the enclosing environment and the binding environment for a function is going to be the same, probably probably the global environment in most of your situations, but usually wherever you create the function, write the function, and associate it with a name, that's gonna be your enclosing and binding environment, okay? So here, if I create a function f, okay? So here I'm working in the global environment, I take the value one, I associate it to y. So here in the global environment, we have the name y, and it has this object one, okay? And here, I'm creating a function x, our function, right, and we give it the name f. So the name f exists in the global environment and it points to a function. This function requires an argument x, right, and so this uh, and the enclosing environment of this function f is uh, going to be the global environment, okay? So 
the name f exists inside the global environment, and then this function that we created, its kind of enclosing <coughs> environment, it gains a reference back to kind of where it was created is the global environment. So that's also the enclosing environment, and the binding environment is the global environment here. Um, you have a distinction between the enclosing environment and the binding environment and stuff when you're dealing with packages, okay? So one of the kind of the weird things that feels weird <laughs> is uh, that the parent of the global environment changes depending on what packages I've loaded, right? Um, and, and if I load packages, like let's say I load ggplot2 and then I load a different package, mosaic, and I load another package, right? Um, let's say you also load those same packages but in a different order. Okay, so if you think about that, the like if I loaded ggplot2 then mosaic, okay, um, my global environment's parent would be mosaic, and then the parent of mosaic would be ggplot2. If you loaded mosaic then ggplot2, then the parent of your global environment is ggplot2, and the parent of ggplot2 is mosaic. That feels a little bit weird, right? Um, I mean, that, that's just how R handles the search path. But then you, if you kind of keep thinking about this, you go, huh, what if we did this weird thing and loaded the packages in a different way? All of these parents change. All of these parent uh, <coughs> environments change. What would happen? And then um, and if you think about certain functions, like if you look at the definition of the standard deviation function, um, the standard deviation function inside R is actually defined in terms of the variance function, okay? So R has a variance function, and then when you ask for the standard deviation, basically it calculates the variance, and then it takes the square root, okay? Which is, I mean, like if you had to do it by hand, that's what you would do also, right? You first find the variance, and then you take the square root, okay? Uh, and that's, that's what the standard deviation function does. And so what if... I created another function called variance, or some some library has a function called var. How is this standard deviation function going to know how to use which var function to use, not to use the one I created, not to use the one in some other package? Okay, um, that's all handled because there's a distinction between kind of this uh, binding and enclosing environment. So to kind of ensure that every package works the same way regardless of what packages we've loaded and what order we loaded those things in, all of these packages require an internal reference called the namespace. And the namespace is where the function package functions are defined, those kind of enclosing environments. Um, so every function in a package is associated with a pair of environments, that is the package environment and the namespace environment. So the package environment is kind of like um, the binding environments where the names exist so that when you do the search path and uh, and it looks for a name, it finds it, right? So the package environment, that's the external interface to the package. This is the environment that R uses to find a function in an attached package and its parent is determined by the search path. So the order in which you load the packages make a difference as far as the package environment. That's kind of like the the binding environment where the names uh, exist. And so the double colon operator is this thing, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but this is can be used to access a function directly from the package regardless of search path. So you have a function called mean in the base package, okay? And then you also have a function mean when you, uh, when you load up mosaic, the package mosaic, there, it creates this function mean as well. And um, and so if you load library mosaic and then you type in mean, um, because mosaic got loaded later, that is um, when R searches for the function mean, it's going to first encounter in the search path, it's going to encounter mean in the mosaic package and it's going to use that. But if you wanted to use the mean function in the base package, you could reference it directly. Even after loading mosaic, you just type in base colon colon mean and it will always use um, the mean and the uh, base package. So again, so if you load in, say, library mosaic here, 
which has package mean, and you search for mean, it's going to find it in Mosaic first. But if you want to use the mean and base, you can just type in base colon colon mean and, and reference that, that thing. Okay? So the namespace environment, right? This is the internal interface to the package. This is how it's going to kind of find any of the variables. That's basically like its enclosing environment. So when it searches for uh, var, the function var, when you need a standard deviation to reference this function variance, okay, it's going to use its namespace, and the namespace is going to reference, you know, the the appropriate appropriate package. Okay, so the namespace environment of a package often contains internal or non-exported variable bindings that allow internal implementation. It's generally hidden from the user, and generally this distinction between the binding environment and enclosing environment is not something you generally have to worry about on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? It is something you have to be concerned about when you start writing packages yourself, okay? So if you're going to write things and you're going to put a, create a package, which you can do, um, then that, that's something that you have to kind of start worrying about, okay? All right, um, okay, let me give you your second view quiz answer. Letter E, E as in elephant or execution environments, I guess. All right. Um, every time a function is called, uh, a new environment is created for the execution of, the, uh, of that function. Okay. The parent of the execution environment is the enclosing environment of the, in of the function. And once the function is completed, that execution environment is just thrown away. All right. So this, here's a very, very simple function. H is a function. Uh, takes in the argument x. Inside the function h, we assign 2 to a, and then we're going to return x plus a. All right, so here I'm going to say, hey, let's call h on 1, and what is this going to return? 3, okay, and then we assign that to y. All right, so what's happening? When we do this, all right, so before, um, so here I'm just creating a function in the global environment called h. When I call h of 1, so this hasn't executed anything here. And this is just running this, this part here, h of 1. When I do that, r, as soon as it says, oh, we're running a function, it creates, establishes this execution environment, OK? So h is this function. It establishes this execution environment. And because we called it with the argument 1 and the definition of the function x, our function h has an argument x, we are going to bind the name x with the value 1. So this, this is the very first thing that happens. R creates this execution environment, and it binds 1 to the name x. Okay, So that's before it runs. It looks at any of the lines of code inside h. Then it runs the very first line of code. First line of code says take 2, bind it, or take a and bind it to the value 2. And so inside the execution environment, we take a and we bind it to the value 2. All right. And then the third line says do x plus a, and r is going to take 1 and 2, add them together. That's the very last line of code in h, so that's what it's going to return. So it reaches this li last line of code, x plus a. It's going to return 3. And as soon as it returns that value 3, poof, that execution environment disappears. Okay. And then now R takes that value 3, which is now created in memory, and then it binds Y to that value that, it was just, that was just returned from the function. So this line returns this value 3, this value in memory, and then R says, okay, now we're going to bind the name Y to that value, that object that was created in memory. And that's, that's what happens. So that execution environment goes away there. Okay. So this happens before it even runs a single line inside the function, right? As soon as, so going back here, as soon as you call the function, it establishes this execution environment. And any of the values that were called during the uh, calling, the arguments, those all get assigned uh, initially before it runs a single line inside that function. OK, so when you call a function, it creates an execution environment. The execution environment 
has two parent environments, the enclosing environment where the function is created, and it also has the calling environment where the function is called. Uh, if you create a function in the global environment and then you call the function in the global environment, then these are the same. Uh, in some cases, though, you might call a function from inside another function, all right? And in that case, the enclosing environment and the calling environments are different. The normal scoping rules, R's normal scoping rules, use the enclosing environment. So if it can't find the value inside the local function, it's going to look in the enclosing environment, the function where it was created. Um, but R also supports dynamic scoping where you can look for values values in the calling environment and we use a special function get to do that. Okay, all right, so here uh, we'll start off with a couple of examples here. Um, zero, uh, X is, gets the value 0, Y gets the value 10. Uh, we create a function F in the global environment. Inside of F we create the values x and y, 2 and 100. We also create a function h, and then the very last line of f returns h, okay? So um, then when I execute f, what will it return? So if I execute f, I do, um, there's no arguments coming in, okay? And I say, okay, x gets 2, y gets 100, and then I create a h, and then I call h. So now uh, I'm gonna call h, and I say, okay, x gets 50 inside h, and we need to, uh, h is going to return x plus y. So I look for x, I find 50. I look for y, what am I going to find? 100. All right, so h is going to return 150. So that, this thing returns 150. That's going to be the last line of code that f re, uh, executes. And so f is going to return 150. OK, what about this here? Uh, x and y, 0 and 10 in the global environment. Inside, uh, I have a function g, and I create a function h. Okay, let's uh, execute h. I execute h, no arguments come in. Inside h, I say x gets the value 3, and the last line of h returns is going to return x plus y. So x is 3. I'm searching for y. What do, where, what do I find for y? h is created in the global environment. So we're going to take 10, we're going to do 3 plus 10. When I call h, I'm going to get 13. All right, I think that's right here. Okay, what about um, when I call g? So inside g, I call g, no arguments come in. First line of g says create uh, x is 2. Second line says y is 100. Then I call h, all right? So then when I call h, what happens? Inside h, h runs, x is 3, and then I say x plus y. So I look for x, I get 3, I look for y, what do I get for y? So remember, the scoping rules is you use the environment that where the function is created. So, so h is created in the global environment, so when it looks for y, it's going to find 10 in the global environment. Okay. And so G, so when I, uh, so H, when I call H here from inside G, it's going to return 13, and G is going to return 13, okay? So when I call G, I also get 13. Because even though I'm calling H from inside of G, H was defined inside the global environment, so it uses the global environment for its scoping rules. This is the difference. This is dynamic scoping, OK? So here, um, I call h. And inside h, x gets the value 3. And then, um, and then I ask for y. And y, uh, for y, I use this function get. It says get y from the parent frame. This is going to be the the environment from which it was called. So it was called in the global environment, so we're going to look for y in the global environment, we get 10. So we're going to do 3 plus 10, we return 13. Here, when I call g, inside g, x gets 2, y gets 100, and then we call h. 
when we call h, we get x gets the value 3, okay? And then y, it's going to pull from the calling environment. So this time, because h was called from inside of g, um, this function get, it's going to find the value 100 here. And then it's going to return x plus y. This is going to return 103. So h is going to return 13, and g here, because of the dynamic scoping, is going to return 103. So h is 13, g is 103. Yes, question? Uh, what does get do if we need to find y in x? Then, um, or, here. Sorry. Uh, yeah. What would it do, what would the get function do if y was not defined in g? Inside of g here? I'm pretty sure it'll uh, search higher until it reaches. Well, I don't know. Let's 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 find out. Um, so so the question is, if I didn't define y gets 100 here inside this uh, parent thing, I think I think it will take 10, but maybe it'll error out. Let me just check. All right. Okay. So right now I have. Uh, Okay, so this is as we currently have it. All right, so when I call H, I get 13. When I call G, I get 103. Okay, so what if I don't do this? Is it, That's what you're asking, right? 13, and yeah, here we get G is 13. Okay, so, so it doesn't error out, but it finds, uh, it's going to find G in the, uh, the parent frame. Okay. All right, last bit, super assignment. Let me give you your, I gave you two answers, right? Third view quiz answer. Third view quiz answer will be the letter B. B as in bear, B as in bear. Okay, so this last bit is on super assignment. The super assignment operator looks like this, looks like a double arrow, I guess. And, uh, and so regular assignment always creates variables in the current environment. Super assignment never creates a variable in the current environment. But what it will do is it will modify existing variables found in the parent environment. Um, and if that super assignment doesn't find an existing variable in the parent environment, it will climb the scoping ladder until it finds the variable it's looking for. And if it reaches the global environment, without finding that variable, it's going to create the variable in the global environment. Um, and I write super assignment should generally be avoided. And there will be sometimes in your homework, you're doing stuff and you'll be like, hmm, I bet I can use super assignment and it will make my life easier because like I'm interacting with stuff in the global environment and I need to change stuff in the global environment. Um, it is tempting to use sometimes, but don't use it. Okay, don't, don't use it. Um, probably you can achieve what you need to achieve with just regular old assignment. You might have to be a little bit creative. It might have to, you might have to group a whole bunch of values together into one object. And then after you run it, you might have to then extract all of those values after you grouped them together into a list. Um, and that is gonna be better than to try to do super assignment as you're doing stuff, okay? Um, so let me just show you uh, what kind of, this is how it works, all right? And, uh, and again, I show you this stuff, but it's always like, eh, but don't do this, okay? So here, x, y, and z are one in the global environment. I'm gonna run the, create this function f. It hasn't run yet, but inside the function f, we're gonna super assign three to y, and then we're gonna return y. So what does this do? When I call f, it's gonna super assign three to y, and it returns y, it searches for y, and it gets 3. And when we ask what is x, y, and z, y is now 3. It's 1, 3, 1. Okay. This is where things start to get a little bit weird. Here I have x, y, and z in the 1 in the global environment. Inside of f, I do super assignment 2 to y, or y to, uh, and then I inside of f, I create a function g, and inside of g, I super assign z and 3 to z, and then we're going to return x, y, and z. Um, and then f itself is going to return g. 
So if I run f, what is it going to return? Well, x is going to be 1, finds that in the global environment. It searches for y, okay? There's nothing here, and actually this thing doesn't create y in the local environment. It changes y up here to 2. And then this 3 uh, for z, this super assignment thing, looks for z in f, doesn't find it, so it searches the higher scope, and it's going to modify z in the global environment, okay? So um, the values x, y, and z in the global environment are now 1, 2, 3, and this is going to return 1 plus 2 plus 3, it's going to return 6. So f returns 6, x, y, and z are now 1, 2, 3 in the global environment. Um, let's try this again. x, y, z are 1 in the global environment. This function f, inside the function f, we're going to assign the value 2 to y. I also do super assignment 4 to y, okay? g, uh, I super assign 3 to z. We're going to return x, y, and z. So we look for x. We don't find it inside the local environment of g. We search the higher scope. We don't find it inside the higher scope. So we go to the global environment, we find 1 for x. Okay, now I'm looking for y. I search for it in my local scope, it's not there. I search for it inside here, and what do I find? I find y has the value 2, right? y has the value 2 in the um, higher scope of f. I look for z. Does z exist inside the local scope of g? It does not. Okay. Does, I search the higher scope. Does z, z exist in the lo, local scope of f? It does not. Z now exists in the global environment, and it has been modified to 3 by this super assignment. So this is going to return 1 plus 2 plus 3. It's going to return 6. Okay. What are the values of x, y, and z in the global environment? 1, 4, and 3. Okay. So here's 6, and x, y, and z are 1, 4, and 3. Okay, um, I got x, y, z, 1, 1, 1 in the global environment. Inside f, y is 2, z is 10. I do super assignment y, uh, 4 to y. That affects not the 2 here in the local environment, but the four, uh, y in the global environment. So y in the global environment is now 4. Inside g, when I execute g, it says modify 3 to z. It's going to search the higher scope. It finds z in, in here, in the uh, local scope of f, okay, the environment of f. So it's going to change this 10 to a 3. Okay? And then we say return x, y, and z. So it looks for x, goes to the global environment, finds 1. Looks for y, what is it going to find? It's going to find, inside f, it's going to find the value 2. Looks for z, and where does this find? It finds inside f the value of z which has been modified to 3 so it's going to be 1 plus 2 plus 3 this is also going to return 6 okay um, what are the values of x y and z in the global environment one, one. y is 4 and z is Z is still 1 because this super assignment for 3 affected this Z, the Z in, inside of F, but not the one in the global environment. Okay? So F is 1, one plus 2 plus 3, 6. And X, Y, and Z in the global environment are 1, 4, and 1. Okay. So <laughs> it's like, it sucks. Okay? This is why, here's, here's an example for why you should avoid super assignment. Okay. Here's a function. And you're like, ah, oh, you know what? Sometimes. Like, I don't want to have to do this assignment stuff. Let's just let's just do super assignment. And so you say, okay, here's this function. I'm going to take a currently existing object, foo, and we're going to add x. Uh, I want to append x squared to it. And so here I say, okay, take that existing object, foo, um, take x, square it, and then append it, basically combine it with foo. And uh, do super assignment back to foo. All right? So we say, okay, well, foo is 2. And I'm going to do add a square root. I do foo comma 5. And so what we want is we want, we want to get 225. So this looks like it's working, right? This looks like it's doing what I asked it to do, OK? All right. What about this? What's going to happen here? I say, OK, bar is another object uh, in the global environment. Bar has the value 10. 
And then I'm going to do add square root bar comma six. So what should this produce? <coughs> 1036, okay, and where does that go? Okay, so we ask, well, what is bar? And bar is 10, and what is foo? Foo is now 1036, what happened? Okay, so we took in bar, bar is 10 and six, and we did 10 and six squared, so we got 1036, but what happened? It got assigned back to foo here. It got assigned back to foo. Okay, and and so foo got changed to ten thirty six. Okay, whereas bar just remained unchanged at ten. Okay, and so if you wanted to do this, the better way is just create a function, some argument baz. Okay, it's going to do baz x squared. It's not doing super assignment, and then so here's foo. Foo is two. We do this. We assign it back to foo. Foo is two twenty five. Here's bar, bar is 10, do add square root, assign it back to bar, and we get bar is 1025. Um, with super assignment, okay, the super assignment is always going to super assign to whatever this is things here. It doesn't, it doesn't know that you want it to go back to this thing, here's foo and this. It just, it's just going to super assign back to foo here. Um, and so super assignment I guess could work in some situation where you're always going to be assigning it back to kind of the same object and you always want to modify that one object. But that kind of defeats the point of a function because the whole point of a function is so you have this flexible piece of code that you can kind of adapt to different kinds of situations. When you use super assignment, whatever name you have here on the opposite where the super assignment is going, it's always going to go there. All right? you, you've lost all flexibility. And so um, yeah, again, something you want to avoid. So, um, so don't use super assignment. Don't, don't, don't be tempted. Okay, uh, we're, we got to wrap up here. Um, and so we'll see you. Uh, so that's it. I think I gave you all three view quiz answers. All right, so have a great rest of your day. And we'll see you on Wednesday.